So we begin today with the first chapter of John. And, and what we see is Jesus is on a mission. He's on a mission of inviting people to follow him so they can find out who he is, but also so they can learn what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. And today, later on in the first chapter of John, what we see is this account of Jesus at the Sea of Galilee, where he encounters uh, Philip and Nathaniel. And after their encounters with Jesus, they have an epiphany and their lives are changed forever. That's what we're going to look at today and see how does that apply to our lives today. What I want to do with you is go through this gospel account in John, kind of verse by verse. And then we're also going to connect it to that Old Testament reading from Genesis 28. Because you may have noticed that there's a, some common language in those two passages. And I'll show you why and how they point to Jesus. So let's start first of all in John chapter 1 verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee, and Bethsaida is up on the northeast side of that, that sea. He went to invite some fishermen to follow him so that they could fish for people. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Isn't that amazing how Philip wasted no time? He immediately went to Nathanael because this Jesus that he had encountered was too good for him to keep to himself. So the first thing he wanted to do was uh, share him with uh, Nathanael as well. He says, we have found the Messiah. This is the guy that the scriptures have been telling us was going to come to us. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now in that time, that's how you would identify somebody. Where did they come from and to what family did they belong? And that's how he introduces Jesus to Nathaniel. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And uh, Nathaniel's kind of famous for his response, right? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Talk about throwing a wet blanket on some exciting news, right? Why such a negative response from him? Well, there could be a couple reasons. One is that Nazareth was one of these little podunk, backwater, blink and you miss it kind of towns, right? Probably more uh, animal population than human population there. No stoplights, not even a stop sign, no post offices, just not much to see or do there in Nazareth. But the other reason besides the fact that Nazareth really wasn't much of a town was that Nathaniel was a Jew and he knew the Old Testament promises of the Messiah. And he hadn't heard of Nazareth in the Old Testament. He hadn't heard of any prophets coming out of Nazareth in the Old Testament. And so he wondered how could the Messiah possibly come out of Nazareth? Was Nathaniel sarcastic, skeptical, confused? Maybe all three. But one thing's for sure, it didn't make any sense to Nathaniel that the Messiah would come from such an insignificant little town. A Messiah from a humble family from a humble town, that doesn't fit the narrative of Jewish believers. Because what they expected was a mighty military ruler who would come in, overthrow the Roman Empire, and then restore Israel to her former glory. So to hear that this is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, that just did not fit the narrative at all. Now, did you notice how Philip responds to Nathaniel's negativity? He doesn't uh, argue with Nathaniel. He doesn't try to prove to him that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't hit him on the head with some Old Testament scrolls. Instead, he simply invites Nathaniel to know Jesus. He says, come and see. Sometimes that's all people need, is to be invited and to come and see. Some people came to our Christmas uh, worship services and Christmas events because some of you invited them. It was neat to meet some of those people who said, so-and-so invited me here. That's why I'm here. Last night, we had a young man named Josh who said, I'm here tonight because somebody invited me to come to church. So it's not just Christmas and Easter where people are open to learning more about Jesus. There are times all throughout the year, and especially in a world where we see this sin and brokenness and this downward spiral that's going on, people are looking for hope. They're looking for peace. They're looking for truth. And we get to say, come and see Jesus because that's where you'll find those things. 
And we can do that at any time, not just Christmas time. This is what Philip did with Nathaniel. He said, come and see Jesus. And then Nathaniel accepted his invitation. So he's on his way to meet Jesus and listen to what Jesus does. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, for a Jew, this would have instantly taken him back to that Genesis account. Because that account of Jacob, which means deceiver, because he deceived his father and got the benefits that should have gone to his brother. I'll just put it that way. And Jacob's name got changed to Israel. So there's a little play on words here. This guy, Nathaniel, has no deceit. And he is a true Israelite. Well, Nathaniel's confused, though. He wonders what Jesus is saying here. How could Jesus know him? He hasn't met Jesus before. So how in the world does Jesus know what kind of a person he is? He's confused. And so Jesus gives him a partial answer here. He says, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Okay. Well, Nathaniel maybe didn't see Jesus, but Jesus saw him. But there's still something else going on here because Jesus didn't just see Nathaniel. Jesus knew Nathaniel. So that means he could see into Nathaniel's heart and see here is a heart with no deceit. And by revealing that to Nathaniel, what he was doing was giving Nathaniel a glimpse of his divinity. Suddenly, Nathaniel experiences an epiphany, and it's pretty amazing that Nathaniel then sees in Jesus the same thing that Philip saw, and he responded in an amazing way. Listen to what he says next Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. That's pretty amazing when you think that it wasn't too long ago he was sarcastic and skeptical and confused about this claim that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. This is the same guy who said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And then he instantly turns around after his epiphany and he says, teacher, you're the son of God and the king of Israel. That's like a spiritual 180 that the Holy Spirit pulled off there. And then Jesus responds this way. He says, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. In other words, he's saying, Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see me teaching and healing and performing miracles and raising the dead. You're going to see me dying and rising again and ascending into heaven, sending the Holy Spirit, and then returning in glory to take you to your heavenly home. You ain't seen nothing yet. And then Jesus says something amazing to Nathaniel. He says, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So Jesus points Nathanael back to that dream that Jacob had, a dream of a ladder, and angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And he says, you're going to see angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. See what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm your ladder. I'm your stairway to heaven. These encounters that Philip and Nathanael had with Jesus were amazing and they changed their lives. And they've got a lot of important things to teach us today. I talked about how with Philip, the important thing there is Jesus is too good to keep to yourself. It's important to invite others to come and see. But I want to focus mostly on Nathaniel here because that statement or that first question he asked has some important implications for you and for me. And here's why. Sometimes we judge and reject others based on outward appearances. That's what Nathaniel did, right? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? And we do the same thing sometimes. Could anything good come out of that person or that place? Let me give you some examples. They're not from my side of town. They're not as educated as me. They're not dressed like me. They're not the same color as me. They're not from the same political party as me. They're not from the same socioeconomic class as me. They don't hang out with the same crowd as me. So how could it, God do anything good in them and through them. It's easy for us to judge others and reject them based on outward appearances without trying to get to know who they are. It's harder for us to see others the way God sees them as people he created and for whom Christ died. Sometimes it's just so easy, though, for us to be quick to judge and reject others based on outward appearances. Now, take that question, though, of Nathaniel's, and let's apply that personally Sometimes we doubt God's goodness in our own lives, right? 
Can anything good come out of my circumstances? I'm guessing that everybody in this room has learned by now that um, it's hard to get through this life unscathed, right? Life in this sin-broken world often deals us some very difficult circumstances. And it's easy to get so focused on how bad the circumstances are that we lose sight on how good God is and how we have a God who can work good in all circumstances, not only for us, but through us for others too. Not everything in life that happens is good. But God's word tells us we can still give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. Not only that, he promises that in all things he's going to work for the good of those who love him. And as we look at the Bible, it's full of examples of that truth. We see one situation after another where one of God's people is facing difficult circumstances and God works through that for good. Let me give you a few examples. Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Joseph, the Exodus, Esther, Ruth. These are all amazing examples of how God took people, his people, who were in very difficult circumstances, and he worked it ultimately for good. But the greatest example of that is obviously Jesus in the Gospels, right? Could anything good come from a poor, young, unmarried couple that's experiencing an unplanned pregnancy? Could anything good come from a government decree to tax people? Could anything good come from an animal shelter for a delivery room and a feed box for a crib? Could anything good come from King Herod trying to kill the Christ child? Could anything good come from the Holy Family having to flee as refugees to Egypt? Could anything good come from all the injustice that Jesus faced in his trials? Could anything good come from Jesus dying on a criminal's cross? Could anything good come from Jesus being buried in a tomb? Can anything good come out of those bad circumstances? Well, the answer is yes, right? The good that came out of those circumstances is, first of all, God's pardon for the sins of our past, and then God's presence and power and purpose for our present, and God's promise of eternal life and an eternal reunion for our future. That's more than just good. That's amazing. God promises to work through all things for our good, and yet sometimes we still doubt God's goodness in our lives. And I wonder if maybe it's because of this. Sometimes we fail to see where God's at work. And so we ask ourselves, where are you, God, and what are you doing? Often what we want is God to work so that it glitters and glows like the Las Vegas Strip. We want God's work to be displayed in the bright lights and the big billboards. But God often chooses to work in ways that seem small and insignificant to the world. Let me give you some examples. God can take a small pill and bring healing to people from big diseases. God can take something like a Luke 2 t-shirt and open up conversations about our Savior Jesus. God can take a little child and model what it means to trust in his promises. God can take a little piece of bread and a little cup of wine and carry Christ and his forgiveness to people in the Lord's Supper. God can take water in baptism to wash away sin. And God can take words in the Bible to transform lives forever. God loves to work through what the world would disregard and despise. And God loves to work through you and me too. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 1. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to the world's standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord." God is busy working in your lives. And God is busy working through you for the good of others, even when you don't see him and even when you don't sense his presence. God promises he sees you always and he's with you always. 
I love Psalm 139, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with that psalm, but I want to share some of the verses because they're just a beautiful reminder of the fact that God sees and knows all, and he's always with us. Listen to uh, what the psalmist writes. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, and your right hand, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the night be light around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. The psalmist reminds us the Lord who made us is always with us and knows everything about us. He knows our thoughts and our words and our deeds. He knows our hurts and our hungers and our habits and our hang-ups. He knows everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yet he still chooses to love us enough to go to the cross for us. So back to that question of Nathaniel. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, since our Savior Jesus came out of there, I guess the answer is yes, huh? And that's the good news that you and I get to celebrate and share so that others can come and see Jesus as their Savior too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for inviting us, just as you invited Philip and Nathaniel, to come and see you so that we can go and tell others about you. Work in us and through us in such a way that many others will be invited to know you as their Savior too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.